There's a specter in the archives. A specter that takes form of trauma. Its presence haunts any who dare to disturb the records. And those who do dare, it fills them with a deep sickness as it reminds all about what has been forgotten. With these specters in mind, the aim of this video is to shed light on the relations of affect theory and the very real realities of intergenerational trauma that are encoded in the colonial archives. By answering the following question, what occurs when survivors of a traumatic colonized past encounter the colonial archives in an attempt to reconstruct their past? To answer this question, I will first need to shed a light on the construction of the colonial archives. This construction flows into the third part, a deconstruction of the colonial archives. Furthermore, deconstruction lends itself to the next step, the decolonization of the colonial archives and the creation of new archives such as the archives that are being created and were created by the truth and reconciliation committee of canada but there's always room for critique thus the fifth part is where deconstruction returns but it is positioned against the national truth and reconciliation committee and the archive as an institution the final two sections will look into the implementation of decolonial and deconstructionalist theories in the real world. In all of these layers, the specter of trauma lurks, and it will return over and over and over to remind the viewer what is easily forgotten. That to some Eurocentric archivists, archives are these magical time capsules, but to indigenous peoples, they are also bullets. The theory of affect is also vital in this essay, as it is often overlooked or overshadowed by the science in archival studies. However, all who engage with the records arrive with known, or in many cases, unknown relations to the records. It is in these known, unknown relations that spark emotions of glee, awe, horror, anger, sickness, heartache, and sorrow. Thus, the dead impact the living, shooting them with the bullets of memory. Memories that may have long been suppressed by trauma. But who the hell do I think I am? What authority do I have to speak about archives, about trauma, about indigenous peoples? I am Ibrahim. The person behind lost futures. I am many things. A teacher, a historian, and a learner. As a historian who is trained by Western theorists, a certain bias oozes out of everything that I write because I am always in relation to the knowledge I have acquired. I, however, am also a member of the Métis Nation. I am part indigenous as I am many things. I'm Lebanese, Syrian, Circassian. I am all of these things simultaneously through relationality. For a span of years, I have been relearning, reconnecting, and repositioning myself to my forgotten indigenous roots. This essay is part of that process. As one can say, I have been haunted by the stories my great-grandmother told my parents. Stories that have affected me to such a degree I pursued history and became a person who uses affect theory. But what is affect theory? Is it simply to feel or to experience emotion? Or is there something deeper, something that haunts and taunts the mind? Merika C. Ford described affect as a force that creates a relation between a body and the world, and by extension, to the world beyond, a world of memories. Hence, making affect theory integral to the indigenous great questions of life, which are, where do I come from? Where am I going? Why am I here? Who am I? When indigenous peoples ask these questions, they are grappling with their place in this world. 
as they are in a process of reconstructing the past by filling in the gaps caused by generations of colonial onslaught against their way of life. These gaps have led indigenous peoples to the archives in search for answers. However, there is a repetition here. Although affect creates relations, archives in a large part are about creating, documenting, maintaining, reconciling, and reproducing such relations between record and people. With these core concepts in the background, let us remind ourselves about the fragility of memory. In many communities in the colonial world, there are fractures in the collective oral memory. Those who initially observed this phenomena wrongly claimed that the oral record was unreliable and inferior to the written. Yet, Weona Wheeler refutes this through consensual conversations with the people of Fisher River and the use of records from colonial sources. Wheeler attempts to stitch the gap in the oral record. From the stitch record, Wheeler deduced that the gap in the oral record was caused by colonial traumas that stemmed from displacement, stress, starvation, humiliation, degradation, and alienation. Furthermore, in times of trauma, there is a break in affect, as relations between body and the world is ruptured, which causes a suppression of memories. This suppression of memory, in this case, was caused by colonization, but also by alienation that was imposed on the Fisher River people. It was a deep alienation from community, family, the past, and self-pervade. Hence, an alienation from the great questions of life. In replacement, alienation made the people of Fisher River question their own culture and way of life. They began to perceive their way of life as strange, and further became strangers to it. Hence, the Fisher River Nation lost their memories, but also their sense of self. However, loss is not the end game of colonialism, as it is not satisfied merely with holding a people in its grip and emptying the natives' brains of all forms and content, but by a perverted logic, it turns the past of the oppressed people and distorts it, disfigures it, and destroys it. However, Wheeler, Memmi, and Fanon are all looking at the relationships between the colonized and their colonized memory. Thus, a question arises, what occurs when survivors of a traumatic colonized past encounter the colonial archives and attempt to reconstruct their past? For it is in these colonial archives where indigenous peoples are re-traumatized and reminded of a past that has been denied and suppressed. Before we converse with the indigenous encounters in their attempt to reconstruct their past, we must first shift and understand the role of the archive in a settler colonial society. This essay has been haunting me for almost a year now, and I kind of go off the rails here to connect affect theory to indigenous trauma and how it's a barrier to indigenous historians and researchers. In doing so, I am also severing myself from my own research. Here's an example of affect theory in action. In my George Bush essay, everything was cool and I was able to research with relative ease until I hit Bilbar's story. Reading Bilbar's story hit me with sorrow and it reminded me about some horrific acts that were committed against Muslims, non-Muslims, and South Asians. This piece of research affected the trajectory of my research, my argument, and how I wrote that essay. There is a sense of anger in it, a sense that there is still injustice, that there are still words that... <laughs> Bilbar's story affected me by instantaneously bringing a forgotten and suppressed trauma. It was tough when I started to write that section, and it was even tougher when I stood in front of my class of mostly white people and started explaining to them about how hard this research was when it hit me. But the archives are objective. The archive is neutral. My essays are neutral. They're objective. Researchers are able to sever themselves from what they research, right? It's just like that show, Severance. They, researchers, are passionless beings that scan through the archives and show no emotion when they fish out something that's cool or horrifying, right? Let's look at constructions now, though. You know, let's, let's forget about <laughs> Let's forget about all this. <laughs> Settler colonial societies such as Canada 
and Australia have long encoded their national narratives with myths. Myths of innocence and naturality, which reinforce the myth that the indigenous people simply disappeared. The first myth, the myth of innocence, is reflected in the archives, as archives have been claimed to be neutral spaces. However, archives are never neutral, but rather exist to reinforce existing colonial hierarchies as inevitable and natural by classifying some individuals as observers and others as observed. Despite being claimed as sites of neutrality, colonial archives are in reality sites of power which contain records not of indigenous peoples, but on subjects. From the inception of the Indian Act, the Dominion Government of Canada under the Honourable Sir John A. Macdonald kickstarted a surveillance project which would document the lives of their so-called subjects. Therefore, the roots of Canada's colonial archiving traditions and practices stem from the Indian Act of 1867. However, the power dynamics between observer and observed feeds into the third myth that indigenous peoples disappeared and so the Canadian state took every means necessary to preserve not indigenous peoples themselves but a record of them. By recording their presence Colonial societies attempt to cement indigenous peoples as objects of a bygone era, turning them into specters. Or as Rin Le Bergland describes it, by discouragingly emptying physical territories of Indians and by removing those Indians into white imaginative spaces, spectralization claims the physical landscape as American territory and simultaneously transforms the interior landscape into American territory. The spectralization of indigenous people fed into the colonial fantasy of empty land, but it resulted in societies that are currently haunted. However, there was also a spectralization in the archives, as the voices of indigenous peoples were silenced. Yet, their silence haunts the archives over and over. It is a haunting that serves as a notification, as a reminder of what kinds of archive exist in the colonized world. But it also reminds historians and archivists alike that indigenous peoples were seen not as specters, but spectators of their history. Despite these hauntings, colonial archives are encoded with racism white supremacy, misrepresentation, harmful descriptions, and celebrations of the colonial conquest. The role of the colonial archive is not to preserve the shameful past, but to justify the colonial archive presence on stolen, haunted lands. This encoding is then decoded by archivists, historians, and ordinary people, which in turn brings back the violence, the trauma, and the crimes. Although historians and archivists have vowed to remain objective, many are in fact affected and stunted as they decode. However, the force of affect differs with indigenous peoples as they experience a return of the violence which inflicts new traumas and opens old wounds. Finally, colonial archives are tasked with keeping colonial notions alive and transmitting them to the descendants of white settlers or invaders. Due to this transmission, there has been a need to challenge the constructions within the archives with deconstruction. The year was 2018, the world was still normal, and I was in an indigenous education course. We were telling history in a circular manner, and the moment of indigenous history I had to cover was the residential schools. Now, I'm a historian, right? So I cracked open the Truth and Reconciliation reports and started reading. I read pages upon pages upon pages of horrific deeds. The stories of children who perished, the children who went missing, and the children who were buried. I felt something. I was deeply affected. But I can jump in time to the summer of 2021 and the unmarked graves that were found. The media went bananas and the Canadian state started to spin a narrative. 
Oh, we're so sorry. Oh, we're so very sorry. We totally just didn't know that there were unmarked graves of children in those schools. No, no, no. It's now 2022, and not much has changed. Justice has not been reached, and the nation remains haunted. Not only by the crimes they committed by stealing and lying on these lands, but is the nation really haunted? Is hauntology really useful? Now I'm a historian, a person who simply fishes through the records, a person who severs myself from my research, right? Is it that simple? Can it be done? Should it be done? Indigenous historians should just sever themselves from those children and tell objective facts. But in doing so, we are severing indigenous historians from children, from the stories that have been forgotten, the stories that have been omitted. And so, if we sever indigenous peoples from those children, those dead children, does that mean we are omitting history? Does that mean we are denying trauma, denying healing, denying reality? For deconstruction to occur, the first must be a recognition that the archive are constructs and are further encoded. However, there must also be a recognition of what deconstruction is and what it is not. Deconstruction is not the act of stripping colonial archives and physically destroying them. Deconstruction is a single theory, a single lens, in the grand room of critical theory. Deconstruction is most famously attached to Jacques Derrida, who attached deconstruction to De Friens. To Derrida, deconstruction was not a simple tool for breaking apart complex constructions to analyze them, but rather a tool to find meaning, to understand what it means to be or not to be. Integral to Derrida's thoughts on deconstruction was language and how humans have tried to place fixed definitions. But to Derrida's findings, definitions and meanings are temporal concepts. In truth, meaning is placed through relationships to a word or to a record or to an entire archive. Furthermore, language is not neutral, but a tool that governs the everyday of the colonized through perceptions, and through systematic methods. Hence, these claims placed a radicalness on deconstruction, as it is not simply analyzing constructs, but challenging systems and seeking out the very building blocks, the very words. For it is words that create laws which in turn govern people or archives. However, in the realms of the felt archives, Derrida's deconstruction and the construction of meaning are well connected to indigenous efforts to reconstruct the past and make sense of what happened by creating relations, by creating meaning. As indigenous peoples wade through the archives and deconstruct the past, they are using theory to create relations to a missing part of their past. These created relations are connected to affect theory, as deconstruction is the theory that is often used to make sense of the pain, the trauma, and the crimes committed on indigenous peoples. However, in deconstructing the past, indigenous people will be exposed to trauma and stress. These are very real situations, and so to alleviate them, there is a need to decolonize the archives. For deconstructing and challenging the colonial archive is not enough, as there is a need for truth, a need for healing and justice. As a reminder, colonial archives captured indigenous records and imprisoned them through the use of laws and the use of language. Thus, decolonization does not simply call for indigenous control over the records, but a complete liberation of the records that are captive. The date is October 10th, 2022, and I am facing my errors. My professor did not like how focused I was on Western theorists. He was right and I was wrong. I only realized how wrong I was when I read Stephanie Rutherford's villain vermin icon Kin, Wolves and the Making of Canada. 
In truth, indigenous peoples have used the quote-unquote theory of deconstruction through a thing referred to as relationality much before Derrida came into being. Reading and learning about indigenous knowledge systems and their use of the thing we call theory blew me away. It humbled me and made me think critically of the thing we call critical theory. I touch on this in my severance essay, but indigenous peoples in the past and today used a method of being that looked like a circle where everything was in relation to each other. The plants, the animals, the bugs, the trees, the water, the mountains, the air, the sun, and the sky, and us, the little people, are all interconnected like a circle. Indigenous peoples lived connected and in relation to other beings. This relationality is further connected to the stories and history. It's brilliant. And to my professor, if you're watching this silly video on archives, I wish I had more time to research. But well, here I am, trying to make things right. What even is critical theory? What is Western thought? How much was stolen from indigenous peoples? Rutherford explores this in her chapter, Empathy. But now we're getting into spoilers. The power to tell a certain type of story and the power to silence another is one attribute of a colonial archive. To many settlers, there is a singular, true narrative and a denial to correct or reconcile the uncomfortable, shameful past. Hence, to decolonize the archive is to take back the stories, the memories, the history and the culture, and the records of indigenous peoples. However, decolonization does not end once indigenous peoples have possession over their history, but once they are able to make that history theirs and have the ability to tell new stories. For stories heal the wounded hearts of the colonized. First, there needs to be a liberation of the records that are held in captivity by the government. Part of the call for liberating the records is to have control over these records. But the archives of colonialism are vital in holding the government accountable. In Canada, these are the archives of residential schools, of reserves, and surveilled communities. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, active from 2008 to 2015, took various actions to retake these archives, but they were denied by the government. The TRC's only choice was to take the government to court and force an acquisition. These battles for truth, for the possession, were not simple battles, as they determined not only who has control over the records, but control over history. Furthermore, decolonizing the archives speaks with Fanon as reclamation and ownership are methods of healing and challenging the colonizer. Yet, there's an extra dimension to healing, and that is holding the government accountable for the crimes they had committed. This is in part to why the TRC would not let the archives of residential schools go, for if they did, they would allow the government off the hook. In addition, many survivors who covered their scars and wounds of trauma from the public felt the TRC was exposing a humiliating part of their past. It must be held into account that to some, these archives are better off in oblivion. However, there are others who wanted to expose the government, as to this day there is a denial, and some claim that the residential schools did not harm indigenous children. Therefore, if the records were tossed into oblivion, there would be an erasure of the violence. Furthermore, survivors have stood witness and shared their stories facing the trauma and with courage they shared horrific stories of the violence and the death that took place. These oral testimonies contest the records of colonialism and the myth of a peaceful conquest. In truth, the conquest of children has had its impact and has caused intergenerational trauma. These new stories gave way to a need for new archives which are now being housed in the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. However, in this story, there are survivors and indigenous peoples who distrust both the Colonial Archive and the TRC. Scholars such as Krista McCracken, Crystal Fraser, and Zoe Todd have questioned the extent the TRC has taken to decolonize its archives but they also sought to explain the reasons behind the distrust.
This part of the essay may be the strongest because it touches on the importance of ownership. It touches on how indigenous peoples in Canada have challenged colonial archives and the legal walls behind them. It also connects well to what I was talking about in the deconstruction part. Yet, I pause when I talk about indigenous peoples wanting the records to be tossed into oblivion. I mentioned that because it shocked me. I came into this essay not knowing how indigenous peoples felt about the National Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There is a complexity to all of this that a single essay, or even the essay format, fails at. I am working with so many layers that I don't know if it even works, or if it is effective. Maybe it would have been better if I focused on ownership of the archives, of stories, and yet this essay on how residential school archives and colonial archives that contain trauma affect people and the distrust factors into it, justice factors into it, and the denial does too. Denial from historians who claim that there was no genocide and there is a continuous covering by the government that factors into this as well. I think what I'm missing is pain. Sarah, Sarah Sara Ahmed talks about pain in her book, The Cultural Politics of Emotion, and I just wish I read that before writing this, because pain is central to all of this, and I noticeably crack up when I talk about how the survivors came forth and shared their stories because there is so much pain. My aim of this essay and my examination of how affect theory plays a role here is for people to recognize the pain and the side effects of researching. A lot of white people or settlers don't fucking get it. They just dismiss it and it pisses me off. So just like my 9-11 video, there's an anger in this essay and maybe it's unprofessional because I'm a historian. I'm an academic. I was trained to sever myself from what I research that to let this anger seep into what I create muddies the water. But I guess I'm rebelling. I am screaming and shouting that I deserve to hold on to this anger, this rage, this frustration, and the total bullshit idea of severing ourselves from what we write or produce or create. I am not a fucking robot. I will not be desensitized. I will continue to be affected and let this anger guide me to new ways of healing, to new ways of challenging the colonial systems at play. But for now, we return to deconstruction. Although the NCTR has navigated through new archival territories and claimed it applied the principles of decolonization to its archival practices, yet there is a lingering sense of distrust. Despite having different types of records in their holding, despite including an advisory survivor circle, the NCTR's placement has garnered critical eyes. Krista McCracken is one of many who has been critically pressing on the institutionalization of the NCTR and its placement by asking, how can an archive located on a university campus which is subjective to university governance be truly decolonized? McCracken further defends her risque question by quoting Jesse Botte, who clarifies McCracken's question by stating, As long as the center is located on a university campus, run, govern, and influenced by the political agenda and institutional confines of the UM, it will remain an institution of memory in the Western sense. Hence, we return to deconstruction, as indigenous archives are being kept in captivity by Western institutions. Furthermore, both McCracken and Botu are stressing for the true essence of a decolonized archive. To this, McCracken states that NCTR does not have the trust of indigenous peoples, and it is not automatically a decolonized archive because of the material it holds. However, this is not said without evidence, but it is in fact rooted in the practices the NCTR took when archiving the records and testimonies of the survivors. McCracken is one of many scholars who has noted the absolute lack of indigenous inclusion in the direct role of archiving their history. She continues, Indigenous peoples in the residential school survivor community in large do not have a direct role in the archival processing or descriptions of the records of the NCTR or the administration of the NCTR. 
these are critical positions against the NCTR, and they are valid, as there is a true fear that the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation's archive will be preserved in Western traditions and thus barring indigenous control. Furthermore, McCracken shows that deconstruction does not simply happen once, but there is a continuous need to deconstruct government institution and archival practices. In deconstructing and critiquing, one may be able to push beyond the perceived idea of decolonization and towards a practice where indigenous peoples are the co-authors of the record. This new shift will be touched on in the next section as we come face to face with affect theory. Reading this a year later makes me feel unsure, and I remember writing this, feeling nervous, as I inked every single word. The Truth and Reconciliation Committee has done so much. It has brought truth into the world, it allowed indigenous peoples who went through the residential schools to tell their stories. It looked into Canadians' colonial crimes. It shed light on a dark and hidden period of Canada's history. It wrote so many important and historic reports. It revealed trauma and pain that Indigenous peoples had held and hid for years. Yet, there it is, sitting on the University of Manitoba campus and not on Indigenous lands. This tension is what led me to critique the institutionalization of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. I wanted to highlight the tension and not bash it, not discredit it, and to this day, I'm not sure if I'm right, and maybe in the future, I'll continue to investigate this better and with more time and come to a better conclusion, a more enlightened conclusion. So, something I omit here, because this essay was submitted to a professor who knows this obvious fact of archives, but the study of archives and the study of history is filled with white people. So, when the task comes to create such an important archive that houses the stories of trauma, it becomes complicated. This is why I am very critical in the creation of institutions around the National Center of Truth and Reconciliation. The question becomes, do indigenous people have full control over the records or their stories? There's also the issue of funding, as the university has full control over that. In my eyes, True decolonization of the archive would be where indigenous peoples have full control and management over the records. Now, why is this important? Isn't it just an archive? Isn't it just a building? This neutral thing? Why does it matter that it's on the lands of the University of Manitoba and not on indigenous lands? Isn't it better that it's closer to researchers? What worries me is that decolonization is only being practiced in words and not in reality. White archivists may go into the field thinking they may change the system, but they become part of it. They are oblivious to the racism, oblivious to the distance, and oblivious to what true control means. My strings of thoughts here are also connected to the idea of land back, but with memory, stories, and records. However, there will be a continued captivity, and this does impact the future. It does impact the creation of history. <laughs> There is a need to move beyond the precedents set by the National Center of Truth and Reconciliation and a need to create new archival methods for indigenous peoples who are eager to reconstruct and regain control over their past. Many set an example of what taking the past may look like, such as Thomas King in his 2003 Massey Lectures on the Truth of Stories and Native Narrative would tell his audience after telling a story, the story is yours. Do with it what you will, but don't say in the years to come that you would have lived your life differently if only you had heard this story. You've heard it now. Furthermore, historian Weona Wheeler follows suit in her reconstruction of the Fisher River Nation's history. Wheeler, caught at the edge of the void, sought out an elder. She could not stitch the oral record because there was such a large gap. The elder simply told her to take it, adding... They took our memories from us. Now you go and take those memories back and make them ours. In doing so, indigenous peoples become co-authors of their history and not the subjects, but there is also a sense of ownership. However, to do this right, there needs to be a shift in the practice of archiving and a shift that values the oral tradition. 
Furthermore, there is the need for archives to be communal rather than institutional as it would regain the trust of indigenous peoples and allow them to exercise their methods of ownership. However, scholars who seek and study the implementation of theory in the real world often come face to face with the theory of affect and the dangers that lay dormant in the archives. First, indigenous archivists and librarians have confessed that they felt burdened to speak for all indigenous peoples. Secondly, Kristen Thorpe's research revealed that indigenous workers feel owned by the institution. Thorpe here is shedding light on the realities on the ground and how indigenous workers have been impacted by exhaustion and have been overwhelmed. In the shift to include indigenous peoples in the archival process, it seems as though the felt archives were previously underplayed and mitigated as a normal side effect. Mareka C4, a scholar on affect theory, has noticed that there is a masculine social construct in the practice of archiving that have delegitimized the subjective and imposed a regime of rationality, neutrality, and objectivity. These social constructs were dismantled as indigenous peoples began to experience trauma and were re-traumatized by the records. However, this brings into question to why archivists before did not catch the racism and the trauma that existed in the archives. To this, Thorpe points to Debbie Bargali, who studied the existence of racism in government workplaces and found a prevalence of racial microaggressions in the form of hostile, derogatory, and insulting behavior, process, and practices, which are often invisible to non-indigenous peoples because racism is seen as normal in a racist environment. Hence, there is a need for safe spaces in the archives and a recognition of the colonial harms that stem from the archives. Moreover, affect theory or the felt archives must be taken seriously by scholars, as these felt archives do burden indigenous peoples. There needs to be support structures that are there for indigenous workers, archivists, and historians, because archives are not just dead people talking. Somehow, they become real people. In 2018, Liliette Russell sent out a survey to her fellow colleagues who were digging through the records of the colonial archive. What she received gives us a glimpse into the realities of the impacts of the felt archives and affect theory on a person's mental well-being. One account described feeling physically ill, heartsick. Another saw blunt racism and animalistic descriptions of the Maori people, who were seen akin to dogs. Without proper training, these descriptions could re-traumatize indigenous peoples and workers who wade through the archives. Furthermore, in researching about trauma, I too felt heartsick, and I questioned if I could write this essay. But I am, and I will finish it. It's time to shift gears to the next section on moving forward and towards the specter. This section was tough because there wasn't much data on what indigenous peoples experienced when they went through the trauma. The hypothesis I had at the start became apparent, that academia does not actually care about how researchers are affected, and the expectation is that researchers must sever themselves from the research and just tough it out. The re-traumatization is mitigated because affect is dismissed. The subjective is dismissed. The self is dismissed because the norm is to become desensitized and to look at historical data as data. Historians go through a rigorous process to axe out bias, but there is always bias because of positionality and relationality to the subject. What I discovered here was that indigenous peoples who engaged with colonial archival data came face to face with past traumas. Because archives are not just dead people talking, somehow they become real people. Thus the specter of trauma I spoke about in the beginning is also haunting indigenous researchers and harming them. It causes some to leave the field because it becomes overwhelming and haunts them day in and day out. Scholars who research affect theory and its impacts have long sought acknowledgement. It seems as the years go by, the specter of affect haunts archivists and the field. But there has been a shift. 
both the Library and Archives Canada and the Steering Committee on Canadian Archive intend to face the haunting of affect and the criticism that scholars have put forth. However, these two institutions reckoned with the importance of affect. There are others who face the haunting and have been pushing for an acknowledgement of the realness of affect. McMish, Sue, Shannon, Falkhead, and Liliette Russell are three leading figures in Australia. All three have radically called for the need of indigenous annotations in the records. They are not calling for a correction of the records, but annotations that challenge the misrepresentation of indigenous peoples and provides an alternative perspective. Russell reckons that indigenous peoples have a right to annotate the records that are about them, as there truly is a silence in the archives. And to combat the silence, the oral record must be integrated and provided. These practices are tough, but the future is at stake here, and these annotations might help future generations understand the context. They might help mitigate the trauma in the archives. On the institutional level, there is the action plan of the LAC, which follows the principles of decolonization and collaboration. Yet, in each statement, there is a we. Who is this we? Is this to place a sense of false ownership? That all now own the records and will move forward together. The question of ownership is vital to this conversation because in reality the government of Canada does not want to relinquish ownership. I further question if the LAC has been truly decolonized as it is a Canadian institution and it may be reckoning with its colonial roots but to their non-indigenous eyes many roots and colonial influences are invisible. Furthermore, if indigenous records are housed in the LAC, will there not be an attachment of distrust? These are all questions that the LAC must face and seems to be facing through inclusion and partnership with indigenous peoples. However, in my perspective, the LAC may be impossible to deconstruct because it is such a colonial institution and it is backed by a government that wishes to maintain a certain type of narrative. In order for deconstruction to occur in the LAC, it must be stripped bare and reconstructed with indigenous values. On the other hand, the Steering Committee of Canada's Archives are now facing the many issues I brought up in my fourth section. There seems to be a reckoning that safe spaces are necessary, but also a deep reflection on the colonial roots that exist in the archives and the Western method of archiving. The framework that they are developing seems to be moving past the LAC and seems to be truly integrating the theories of deconstruction and decolonization. The framework addresses support for traumatic experiences and cultural and sensitive materials, but also ownership and the need for education. Education that focuses on how indigenous people's concept of ownership differs from the western concept, but also an education on mental well-being. Finally, there is an emphasis on indigenous rights and their rights to know, a right that will help them take back their past and reconstruct it. There seems to be always an endless process of deconstructing the archive, as the colonial roots are deeply rooted in the minds and the practices of archivists. Thus, there is a need to move forward, a need to move beyond, but as indigenous peoples move forward with their history, they may forever have to challenge the existing colonial archives. They may forever face the specter of trauma that lurks in the archives. The specter of trauma has not been vanquished, nor can it ever. But it can be recognized, and those who come face to face with it must be believed. They must be trusted, but to the non-indigenous, the specter haunts them, and they may close their eyes and cover themselves with objectivity, rationality, and stoicism, but they cannot hide forever, nor cover their shame, their sins, and their crimes. For the specter will not stop, and it will haunt them over and over and over again. The specter reveals and further uncovers the colonial roots in the archive, and the role they played in creating myths, narratives, but also Spectres. For the voices of indigenous peoples in the archives were silenced, but even if they were silenced, if they had become spectres, indigenous peoples can still hear the sounds of silence. The spectre of trauma is also seen lurking around the projects of decolonization, which is tasked 
with deconstructing the colonial archive. However, the Spectre calls for more than decolonization, for justice, for liberation and healing. The Spectre does not rest as it reaches with its ghostly hands, haunting more scholars to rise and criticize the institutions behind the archives as it calls again for the liberation of the records of trauma, of violence, and of a history that can easily be covered. It is a specter that seeks to hold the government accountable and can only rest when indigenous peoples have true ownership over their records, over their memories. Finally, the specter of trauma calls to archivists, historians, and indigenous peoples alike, reminding them that it is not a phantom, that it is not an imagination, but that it is real and something that is felt by all who scour the archives. Hey, welcome to the end of the video. I'm stealing this from FD Signifier, but all of you have homework. You have 24 hours to go out there into the world and get affected by something. A record, a meme, a picture, a video, a song, a sight of scenery, this picture of Turb. And once you felt something, you have to report back and explain how the thing affected you. Now, go forth. Be affected. Open your hearts and souls. There were some things I omitted, like this archive part where I explain what archives are, but it felt like I had three introductions, so I cut it. Someday I want to make a video on how history is made, and I'll explain archives there. Honestly, this video was tough to make, so if you wish to support me on Patreon, it's linked below, but if you can't, a like, a subscribe, a comment, and a share would help a ton. I also had to be super serious and professional, because when talking about residential schools and trauma, there is no room for jokes. If I made jokes, it would seem like I'm not taking indigenous issues seriously and I'd be disrespecting people who have been hurt and who have suffered and who have felt pain. Anyhow, the next video is going to be the total opposite as I'm finally going to talk about the show, the anime, Gin Tama. I hope you learned something about archives or Canadian history, but if you didn't, well that means you have to rewatch the video again until you do learn something. So, until next time, take care, and saddam.